Thanks for coming, everybody. Virginia Heffernan has written for the New York Times, for Slate, for Wired, for Harper's, uh, Yahoo News. We don't hold that against her, though. Um, I actually read the whole thing over the weekend, and that's saying something, because I don't always read these books. But it's a really good read. I encourage you all to buy it. Um, but we have a lot of people talk about, oh, the internet is changing everything, and you're probably as tired of it as I am. But this isn't really like that. This is made me think about things like why pictures are taken over the internet, because even though I was here the whole time, it didn't kind of surprise me. And, and also why uh, telephone calls were really good in the old days, and now they kind of suck. Um, but what Virginia's going to talk about today especially is YouTube, in fact, reading from her chapter. Um, so please welcome Virginia Heffernan. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, I um, this is like really is like being at Anchor Wat. I've never been to Anchor Wat, but I have it in my head with the same, in like in the same place in my heart and brain as the Googleplex. Um, so um, live up to it. Live up to it. Um, I mean, I usually just talk, but I, because because you're Google, I it thought it would be um, interesting to talk about. Um, a little bit about my fascination with YouTube before um, the Google acquisition. So um, cast your minds back to January 25th, 2006, when a mysterious image showed up on YouTube, the video sharing site that was then only three months old. A sinewy figure in a swimming, swimming pool blue t-shirt, his eyes obscured by a beige baseball cap, was playing guitar. Sun poured through a window behind him. He played in a yellow haze. The video? was called simply Guitar. A handmade title card gave the performer's name as Fun 2. The piece Fun 2 played with mounting dexterity was an exceedingly difficult rock arrangement of Pachelbel's Canon, the composition known from the turn of the century for known for solemn chord progressions and overexposure at weddings. But this arrangement, attributed on another slide to someone called Jerry C was anything but plotting. It required high-level mastery of a singularly demanding maneuver called sweep picking. Over and over, the guitarist's left hand articulated strings with barely perceptible movements, sounding and muting notes almost simultaneously, and playing complete arpeggios with a single stroke of his right hand. The video was thrilling to watch. Almost instantly, I was hooked. I hadn't yet seen selfies of any kind, handheld or selfie stick enabled, nor had I seen video on Skype or FaceTime, so I wasn't accustomed to this intensely focused exhibitionism, the pleasingly distorted self-portraits in moving pixels, often of family and intimate friends that now flood our screens. Fantu's own selfie video was curious, masturbatory, David Hockney colors plus chiaroscuro. The effect was not wholesome. The video lacked the creamy resolution, crystalline audio, and voluptuous effects associated with professionalism, and with even the average MTV entry. Amateur, homemade, flawed, not so much mesmerizing as provocative. The critic Harold Bloom wrote that to behold is a tragic posture, to observe is an ethical one. Fun too required near clinical observation. You didn't behold this video as you might a Hollywood movie, enraptured by the spectacle. You inclined toward it and you studied it like a scientist. You peered as it scrambled porn on a high and forbidden channel. As soon as I leaned forward, I had reached for Tolkien's ring or tasted some life-altering drug or crossed a magical line and there was no going back. Just as Nabokov forces us to take Humbert Humbert's language into our very mouths in the opening of his great novel of child rape, Lo Li Ta, the tip of the tongue taking a trip of three steps down the palate to tap at three on the teeth. This video seemed to implicate anyone who watched it. I played guitar again, then again. A small miracle was quietly happening in those first months on the site. The bona fide pornography that was widely expected to drive out all other video genres as a predator plant strangles diverse flora and unbalances ecosystems never showed up. Without actual porn, the subtle voyeurism of guitar stood a chance of becoming a hit with viewers, and hit it was. By the end of its first week on YouTube, the video had already been viewed one million times. 
By 2016, its various versions had drawn more than 10 million views, and for years, it was regularly listed among the most seen snippets of online video in the history of the World Wide Web. We are now used to numbers, like 10 million views you probably didn't even look up. But I was reviewing television at the um, at the New York Times at the time, and we no one could get a view. Like you know, the people that had made thirty something put up a new show um, on uh, on NBC, and you know they got fifteen million viewers the first night. And this is on the networks. So I was reviewing television, and I saw this video, and I couldn't. It was like you know, Marshall Herskowitz, who who made thirty uh, something, said, um, "Where is everybody?" You know, where are these viewers I've been looking for? When I went to YouTube, I realized they're here. I know where they are. Um, working as a critic and a columnist for the New York Times, I'd acquired some unusual new habits since YouTube launched. Guitar only threw the problem into relief. As network television contracted, the media business folded a dozen of magazines, and YouTube was acquired by Google for $1.65 billion. Again, sounds like a small number now. Um, with other one billion plus tech acquisitions and giant IPOs in the offing, I found myself mystified by how much time I spent away from the tattered armchair tokens of my youth. Books, magazines, newspapers, the broadcast networks, and the ever-present murmur of NPR. While there was still achievement and pleasure in the old media, it was clear, too, that the dogs had barked. The great caravan that brings knowledge and ideas that shore up human enterprises had moved on. I renewed my subscriptions to Vogue and the New York Review of Books until I didn't anymore. Back issues piled up on my coffee table and then became part of recycling, landfills, and compost. They weren't culture. They were carbon, part of the problem gumming up the environmental works. The same thing happened to the novels that I ordered in hard copy from Amazon. The spell that had been cast over me by inked letters on white pulp was broken, or more accurately, a new spell had been cast on a separate part of my brain. The deeper I ventured into the civilization I found online, the more I realized I'd need more new models of courage and imagination to contend with the trippy, slanted, infinite dreamland of the rapidly evolving web. Fun 2 became my hero. The velocity, intricacy, and exactness of his performance modeled the rhythms and mental requirements of the web itself. Fun 2's guitar video speaks to me now a decade later, just as a chalice of certain dimensions tells us something about the people who inhabited a lost world. From a chalice, we know how big were the hands that were meant to hold it, how much liquid people liked and could consume, what kind of liquid, cold or hot, basic, basic or acidic, they considered potable, what type of surface their cups might sit on. The dozens of hours that I spent feeding my obsession with guitar were not wasted, or not entirely, or so I told myself. <laughs> the video was, in fact, as fun too, who was born Jiang Hyun Lim, told me when I finally met him, it was intended to be instructional, an early contribution to the now encyclopedic how-to category on YouTube which I would later consult to learn umbilical care for my infant daughter, as well as how to shield an iPad from scratches and how to make progress in a Wii game called Lego City Undercover. That's not cheating. That was learning how to make progress. <laughs> for me, the video contained a powerful suggestion of the kind of person I'd have to become if I was to keep a clear head in the new medium that had come to dominate my mental life. And I was not alone. The internet was pervading the lives of all of us who were growing into this newly transmogrified social and aesthetic space, from my neighbors and colleagues, friends and children, to musicians in Taiwan and Seoul and all the 1.4 billion active users of Facebook. In the fun two days, well before the efflorescence of elegant services like Spotify for music, Reddit for ideas, every time I say that, someone just like, elegant ideas? But anyway, Reddit for ideas. <laughs> Pinterest for collages and Instagram for photographs before Steve Jobs' death and even before the iPhone, the socialization and mobilification of everything, then the move to wearables, so-called Internet of Things, 3D printing, and virtual reality. Right then, the web asserted itself as its own culture, right at the dawn of Web 2.0, when newly expansive broadband permitted the dissemination of video and the rise of social networking. The Internet became something more than a reformulation of the offline world. With cries variously of agony and triumph, we had to stop pretending that email was a handy alternative to telephones or post. Fluid and never-ending electronic exchanges made the word communication seem inadequate. Similarly, newspapers on the web could no longer be considered mere adaptations of newsprint. 
1992 flashback. This is an actual trauma that I still can't believe I included in the book. A traumatic moment in early adulthood came just as I was uh, having doubts about my first choice of career academia. I'd started a PhD program in English in 1991, just after graduating from college, but though I was supposed to be refining my skills at rigorous academic prose, the grubbier work of Greil Marcus, I understand he just spoke here, um, whose book Lipstick Traces took seriously pop culture and a pop idiom captured my attention. I also would try to cop ca copy Camille Paglia's outlandish observations about art, though they were considered suspect in university settings. One day, my highly traditionalist father, he's a college professor, um, nailed me for this. He has a very um, mid-Atlantic accent, like right squarely between New York and London. Um, Virginia, your prose can be a touch glib, or rather meretricious. What's meretricious, Dad? Oh, Virginia, come on, meretrix, from your Latin, like a prostitute. Oh, did you get nothing out of Latin camp? My father <laughs> called me a prostitute. This is not an easy dialogue to recall, but the eccentricities of the early 90s are a useful reference point when taking the measure of the internet's influence. These were the days before the web. The Mount Vesuvius of digitization was faintly rumbling, but most of us were determined to block out the noise. Sure, there was email, but texting and tweeting had not yet made glibness, my kind of glibness, compulsory. The Meritrix, by other names, had not yet become an Instagram paragon. Mandarin and emoji had not yet left Latin in the dust as second languages of choice. These were exciting times filled uh, uh, with these transitional technologies, desktop published zines, and other forms that presaged blogs, but cultural loyalists were still hoping to hold on. Today, holding on is impossible. The tectonic shift has happened. The New York Times daily newspaper and the company's news apps are starkly disparate, um, disparate entities. Uber is something other than a municipal taxi service. Airbnb is not another kind of hotel. E-commerce at eBay, Amazon, Etsy is not analogous to, to catalog shopping. It has its own rules, conventions, uh, implications, pace, and pricing. Between analog and digital are more than differences in degree. Between them is a difference in kind. Like all new technologies, the internet appears to represent the world more faithfully than technologies that preceded it. And the internet is an extraordinarily seductive representation of the world. We've never seen a work of art like it. That is the book's central contention, that the internet is a massive and collaborative work of realist art. And moreover, it's so beguiling a realist showpiece and so readily confused with reality that books about it call themselves books about business, politics or science, the reigning bywords for reality itself. That is a mistake. Digital forms are best illuminated by cultural criticism, which uses the tools of art and liter literary theory to make sense of the internet's glorious illusion that the internet is life. Because of course the internet is not life. It's a highly artificial regime with tight rules and rituals that organize its text, music, and images. That's why the internet becomes more deeply meaningful and moved when read as an aesthetic object than lived or reported on as firsthand human experience. The human experience is art, where art is, that human experience is art, where art is considered closer to a game than to a deception. Our proxies in this game are our avatars, the sum total of all the profile pictures, message board communiques, Snapchat videos, and all other artifacts of text, image and sound that we add to the internet and attach to our various handles. The game itself and artwork is without doubt what video gamers call a massively multiplayer online role-playing game. Um, it's funny because I'm having to cut things out so that I don't over explain to all of you. I mean, you know what a massively multiplayer online role-playing game is, but sometimes people don't. So I'll save you my very labored explanation of what they are. Deta digital life in its current extremely visible, uh, visual, social, portable, and global incarnation rewards certain values, and they're not the ones many of us grew up with. Engagement, emotional expression, liberalism, tolerance, self-knowledge, irony, these values of the 70s lost a great deal of urgency at the turn of the millennium. So I felt that I was trying to learn a certain new set of values, a new aesthetic, and a new, a new politics, um, a new way of being, new modus vivendi. Um, and while I was trying to learn, I practiced the finger work required by my laptop, my Blackberry, and eventually my iPhone. 
and what writers, workers, teachers, parents, students, artists, and companies have all appeared to be trying to learn too, these new skills and interpretive methods, many of which didn't have names yet. Just as one example, when uh, uh, the Fun2 video and some other videos um, from YouTube and other early video sites came over my desk, I was writing about television at the Times, and I, as I said, I thought like, oh, maybe this is you know, something interesting that I could write about. My um, more senior colleague in TV got to write about like the Sopranos premiere and Six Feet Under finale. And so I was sort of writing a lot about reality television. And so I was looking for a way to like make my name, like write more, you know, write something exciting about something new. So I saw this, uh, this online video um, and I thought, you know what would be great? The Times could host all this, I called it internet television, like I still have a folder on my desk for internet television, because I was a television critic, so I wanted to persuade everyone that I could now write about internet television, it'd be like cable. So um, I had this idea that the Times would host a video a day, all the video that would ever appear on the internet, we would host it on our site, and then I would write like a capsule review of each one, and it would just be this like daily thing, because I thought that we would probably see about one video a day on the internet. <laughs> you guys know the numbers at YouTube. Um, so um, uh, after dusting off hundreds and then thousands of videos on YouTube, but this is another thing I think about YouTube. You know, art forms like color field painting or, or punk music um, usually start in one place and they have names attached and they grow outward. YouTube, it was like discovering a lost civilization. I mean, I, I, I should talk again to uh, Hurley and Chen about this, but I don't know, I know the first one that was up there, but I don't know at what point they started to get close to the numbers that YouTube has now for uploading. I mean, it seemed as though there were already, there was never a time that there weren't at least a million videos on that site. You know, that you weren't like looking at three one day. Um, and uh, so it was like dusting off these hundreds and thousands of videos, like a civil, and seeing the civilization that they composed. Online video isn't a new art form like, like punk music. Um, instead, the art of the internet and its rules kind of came into view all at once and fully formed. All over the world, amateurs had apparently spent the years since the birth of camcorders in 1982 and digital video in 1986, shooting, producing, collecting, and transferring home movies, video art, pet and baby videos, surveillance videos, including some that showed personal interpersonal, I'm sorry, police, interpersonal, and corporate misdeeds, um, music performances, ads, trailers, sermon, lectures, comedy sketches, theater scenes, pornography, magic tricks, athletic stunts, pranks, uh, medical anomalies, virtual tours, news broadcasts, all of these were just waiting around needing an audience. Now, by 2016, more than 100 hours of video are uploaded every minute to YouTube. Hours that come with a dizzying uh, range of styles, themes and provenances. Many of them had clearly been produced well before the possibility of online broadcasting ever existed. Um, the 1950 coronation of Queen Elizabeth, for example. The first videos mounted to YouTube included a scene of civil disobedience shot in a bus in Singapore, a monologue by a Best Buy clerk, and fully 14 short uh, movies of mammals playing with shoelaces. Every single one of them zinged around the web and collectively attracted far more passionate responses than the multi-million dollar slates of new network television that I regularly reviewed. The internet favors speed, accuracy, wit, pro, um, prolificacy, someone just corrected my pronunciation, prolificacy, um, and versatility. But it also favors integrity, mindfulness, and wise action. For however alien in appearance, the internet is a cultural object visually on a continuum with the cultural ob artifacts that preceded it. It's not a break with history, neither is it progress. It's just what happened to be next. The internet's responsiveness to critical tools, the kind used by English majors, historians, bloggers, readers of every stripe, including rogues like commenters, tro trolls, and knee-jerk tweeters, has been elucidated um, in the way that, in the stuff that I've studied, um, Baroque audiovisual projects by composers and sound designers. Um, the hallmarks of internet culture come through in experiments like Netflix and Amazon Originals, arguments and reports serialized on Twitter, podcasts like NPR Serial, and the new media franchises of reality TV heroines. Um, but companies, um, anyone can witness this from the front row, the emergence of a new hierarchy of values at Wikipedia, Facebook, Twitter, here, here Instagram, Spotify, Snapchat, Skype, and so on. 
But companies rise and fall on the strength and value to advertisers of what we at Yahoo News, where I covered digital politics during the 2012 election, we used to optimistically call their assets, visual, auditory, or textual. At least they weren't liabilities while I was making them. These assets are nearly always ironic, cartoonish, or dramatic extensions of established and even ancient art forms. Aphoristic poetry suitable for Twitter, painterly images for Instagram, polemics, essays, and reports for Facebook. The web represents a grand emotional, sensory, and intellectual adventure for anyone willing to explore it actively. Alarmist tracks that warn about how the web endangers culture or coarsens civilization miss the point that the same was said in turn about theater, lyric poetry, the novel, film, and television. Having written about television for you know such a, such a long time, I got really used to writing about something that was treated as an art at the New York Times on the culture pages. So I sat next to someone that wrote about opera, music, uh, you know, museum shows, books. Um, but treated as a public health hazard in the rest of the newspaper. Um, so um, this is, you know, not uncommon. And in some ways, I like that it that you know what we do, what we immerse ourselves in, is considered in some ways like a neurotoxin or a disease um, that we're addicted to it. Um, you know, it tends things that make you feel truant, like you're doing something that you shouldn't be doing. That tends to be, as um, Bob and I were discussing those vulgar art forms tend to be thriving. You know that an art form, I think, is in trouble when there are suddenly MFA programs in it. Um, so the first time there's, like, it'll be a time to sell Instagram, short sell Instagram, when, uh, when there's suddenly an MFA program on, like, the art of the selfie. Um, <laughs> the, inst the internet is the great masterpiece of human civilization. As an artifact, it challenges the pyramid, the aqueduct, the highway, the novel, the newspaper, the nation state, the Magna Carta, Easter Island, Stonehenge, anyone want to argue? <laughs> um, <laughs> agriculture, the feature film, the automobile, the telephone, the Chanel suit, the airplane, the pencil, the book, the printing press, the radio, the realist painting, the abstract painting, the birth control pill, the elevator, and cooked meat. As an idea, it rivals monotheism. Just as in Nietzsche's scheme, man created science, which in turn killed God, analog culture, that's books, clocks, film, industrial machines, the compasses and timers of scientific method, those things created digital culture. And now digital culture has superseded them. It was quick, that supersession. And now it's over, but where are we? Magic is a word Apple vigorously embraced, and it's a term of art from engineers. I don't. Um, I don't want to summarize because I know I'm in a company that is probably above my head on this, but as I understand it, a program is magic to the extent that it makes very complicated, um, what would be very complicated processes seem easy. Um, and um, the word loss in the title comes from um, the problem of lossy compression, so that uh, you know, the MP3 form of representing a musical signal tends to compress that signal um, to thin it out somehow, and it loses something. What that thing is, is what I want to take the measure of. So in digitization, digitization is lossy. This civilization is lossy. Its effort to represent and reproduce what went before it loses something. And that's what the lost part of the book um, attempts to um, size up. 35 years ago, when I first discovered it, the internet wasn't easy to find. It wasn't a user-friendly retail franchise as the web is now. It was a nervous back office full of furtive clerics. You stumbled in. While computer hardware and software of the 1970s were the work of sophisticated engineers who pressed computers into the service of everything from music to word processing, architecture, and filmmaking, the slow and awkward networks in those days had limited application. These were the so-called Eve networks, inspired largely by ARPANET, the landmark. <laughs> I was going to tell you what that is, but I think you know. Logically, the internet in its early days was kind of a diversion for Cold War intelligence types and academics. But it was possible to stumble into it. And I know because at nine years old, I was one of the stumblers. Excalibur was an early social networking technology developed at Dartmouth College. It was the heyday of Dungeons and Dragons. It was 1979. And in that day, the vaguely King Arthur theme appealed to both hackers and tweens like me. Um, now, the Excalibur's real purpose was to facilitate communication among several academic and scientific institutions that shared Dartmouth's mainframe computer. It was one of those big heaving rhinos 
um, that, you know, in a cage of bulletproof uh, plexiglass sighed and rattled. Um, every day, a few hundred people died and dialed into that mainframe for an alien signal, the like, eek. I loved that sound. I mean, when I first heard that sound, I was like, that's all the information in the world just coming into my life. Um, we would fit our receivers into these acoustic couplers like people into kayaks. As a townie preteen, I hacked in with the help of some shaggy, kind Dartmouth students who called themselves CISPROGs. In those days, Dartmouth CISPROG sounded tantalizing to me the way lead singer sounded to some of my classmates. John Kameny, then the president of Dartmouth, had co-written the computer language basic in 1964, inspiring a generation of student programmers who got called Kameny's kids. They built this extraordinary Dartmouth time-sharing time system. Most of them are out, out, there, out here now. The CISPROGs of the 1970s and early 80s also tended this mainframe as it shook and rattled in its cage on the edge of Dartmouth's colonial campus. So with some friends, I found my way to their computer center. Our trick was to tell our parents that there was no way we would be able to work for NASA unless we hung out with these guys all day and played Dungeons and Dragons. It was a pretty good, um, it's a pretty good little, little scam we had going on. It was 10 years after the moon landing, so you know, just anything that you could tell your parents to help you get to the moon, they were happy to oblige. Um, with some friends, I found my way to the computer center uh, to talk about BASIC. Um, Kameny had uh, taught re rudimentary BASIC to the y local Yankee school children, presumably to win the freedom to pursue his uh, non-Yankee plan for ARPANET on the Connecticut. To mollify our parents, we told them we were going to work for NASA. But the little girls of 10 and 11 who stormed Excalibur never made tech history. That worked for us at the time. All the better to enter the shadowy world of Excalibur and especially an addictive live chat feature called Conference XYZ without being noticed. Conference XYZ amplified Excalibur's fantasy element. Each convocation had levels and a self-anointed master who could banish chatters he disliked. So if you signed on early in the morning, you'd have to get a, a code. It went off at night, like TV. Um, and but you would try to get up early and sign on early, and you needed uh, the code of the day to be able to like sign on. So that would have we'd have to like call each other and tell each other that, and the sysprogs would set that. So if you got on first and you were the master, <laughs> oh my gosh, you've been there. Did I see you on Excalibur? <laughs> um, I was Athena. Just you know, I was nine. So um, I. I yeah, they. Um, so you would sign on, and then you could just banish anyone you didn't like if they were talking. I mean, it would be fun to do this on Twitter someday because they, <laughs> like, people would talk in public space, and if you just uh, in reply all, and if you just didn't, if they swore, and you would always say back to that. There was like a macro for keep it clean, folks. For some reason, like keep it clean, folks. Um, but also, if these guys at the Merchant Marines Academy would write in all caps, and for some reason that meant that they were like ideologues, even if they were saying normal things, just writing in all caps was a way to get yourself just like <laughs> killed. Um, and but then sometimes one of the Merchant Marines, one of the ca all caps people, would be the master. Like he would have gotten the code, and you'd be like, oh, it's going to be such a bad day because he's not going to like hush all the um, he's going to hush all the people we like. Um, you know, I went on because I was 9, 10, 11, 12. I just couldn't get heard at the dinner table, and I had some very interesting ideas about Reaganomics that I wanted to share with anyone who would listen. And, um, and uh, you know, I, I don't think it's unlike how lots of us come to the Internet now. I, you know, you feel like too young or too old or too fat or too black or whatever for social life, and you, so if you're... Uh, uncomfortable in physical space, you know, I wasn't athletic, and I was a good writer, so, like, I could be a superstar, you know, I could be Athena, um, and, um, and it was extraordinary how fast this thing grew. I was, uh, there was an article in The Atlantic maybe 10 years ago, but it said that every time you f they find bones of primitive people, primitive man, nearby those bones are the bones of a, a domesticated wolf, a wolf, a dog that there's never been humans without dogs like really nearby. Um, and one of the contentions of the book is there's never been engineering without culture right next to it. So there's never been a time that people were creating the, the, the internet that they weren't also posing as Apollo, Athena, whatever, to chat with each other about 
um, end runs about, but ultimately about anything, about what they were having for lunch. So that's what I, I so I bypassed the part where I could have learned to code, and the four other people that were interested in John Kemeny's talk, all boys, didn't moon for the sysprogs. They went off and like actually learned something and probably work for NASA now. But um, <laughs> but so yeah, so the, this is a book length effort to justify my decision to be Athena and not like learn Fortran or whatever. Um, in any case, the culture that we were creating, um, uh, well, okay, by the time I turned 13, I was confident, the way I would later be confident that I'd seen every single video online, I was confident that I knew every single person online. Like, I just was like, Apollo, Bumblebee, me, you know, just like, I just, it was a list, you know, I had a hundred of us in my head. My parents couldn't have guessed that I was meeting anyone. They just saw me sitting hour after hour at a computer. The computer was a Zenith Z19, a dumb terminal. Um, it was like a Chromebook in the sense that it, without the mainframe, there was nothing in it. it just had to dial into it. And, um, and I just would stare at that thing. You guys can remember it from war games. Um, it's like these green phosphor letters in the front and then this just deep yonder, just dark space behind it. And I just would peer into that space and just wonder what was out there. You know, people were saying things in the foreground about Reaganomics, about Dungeons and Dragons, about Led Zeppelin, huge topic of conversation on Conference XYZ, <laughs> runes. Um, and, uh, and I would just try to speculate, like, how are they getting in here? What in that squeal crash sound is, is bringing all this into my life? And there was a huge amount of projection. Like I see it in my kids when they look at a, the, a Minecraft screen. It's like practically illegible to me, you know? It just seems so abstract. And yet, when I hear them talk to each other, they say, there are not enough of these videos on YouTube, by the way, of kids playing Minecraft and talking about it, but you know, they're looking at something that just looks like this kind of beigey, greeny, ochre blur, and saying to each other, like, we're gonna need a tribunal because you killed my sheep. Like that, you know, that's actually a real thing. And it, I mean, they might as well be looking at a brick to me, like ha for a sense of, as much sense as it makes. And I was having this incredibly emotional experience and essentially looking at this dark screen um, and really coming of age. Um, I got off because uh, I finally um, met someone. I, his name was, his screen name was John G. So he had like a kind of normal screen name. Um, and, uh, and, I told him that I was 14, he was 18, Dartmouth student, and he asked me to go to a bonfire with him and like play with light sticks or whatever. So I went on my first date with someone that I had met on there. And I was really excited and I told my real friends the next day that I had like been out with this 18 year old guy and I was really excited. And uh, it's kind of like maybe when you meet someone on Bumble now or Tinder or whatever that you, um, you don't want the question, how did you meet him? You know, you just, you want to like delay that for a little bit. But anyway, Hallie Davis asked me, how did you meet him? And I was like, I just this game that I play. And she was like, is that on the computer? And I said, yes. And she said, um, desperado. <laughs> and suddenly I was like, I will never look at a computer again. <laughs> and I didn't, I closed it down. Um, the story of early computer networks has most often been told as a technology and business story. But like the internet today, Conference XYZ was not an engineering experience as much as an immersive, uh, immer not an engineering experiment as much as an immersive experience. What mesmerized me and its other users were its cadences and its vocabulary, its vibe. On some level, while we were seeking com connection and community, we were also helping to build a culture and today I see that culture writ large online. Have all the same, you know, little cultural flourishes, like what kind of, are you going to write in all lowercase or all caps or mixed cases or l use little uh, hyphens instead of m dashes or, um, or uh, make reply all errors. I mean, I, you know, I just remember it was like this rite of passage that you were going to mess up with RA reply all sometime instead of replying right to the person and, um, you know, and get uh, hazed for it and learn. Um, Conference XYZ pretty much folded in 1986. For years, I half repressed thoughts of Excalibur. It would come back to me in fragments. The odd jargon we evolved, the hot feeling of being watched, the invective, the jokes, the speed. The highly collaborative project had been a spontaneous creation of a scene and a modus vivendi, an entire culture. Had we really done all that and was it really gone? It was not gone. 
What I thought was the end of a short detour from regular life was actually the beginning of the biggest cultural phenomenon of our lifetime. If it's ever fair to say anything, changed everything. It's fair to say so about the internet. At stake in this cultural transformation are the way we live, think, love, talk, and fight across the globe. The internet is entrenched, and it's time to understand it, not as a curiosity or an entry in the annals of technology or business, but an integral part of our humanity, the latest and most powerful extension and expression of the project of being human. Thanks. Hi, thanks so much for coming. Thanks. Um, I'm particularly interested in like why people will take the time to post on YouTube and build up their audiences, especially as it relates to like sharing expertise. Yeah. And especially if that expertise isn't like socially credentialized. So like yeah. their expertise to them, the expertise is like how to use Snapchat or how to uh, query the cache on your device. Yeah. And so I'm curious like what you think are the elements um, of a successful atmosphere that yeah. like encourages that type of behavior. Yeah. I couldn't tell that, I thought that fun to, so Jen Hyun Lim's video, when I first saw the guitar video, did, have people, do people know what I'm talking about? That video? Wow, all right, well in that place where you, where all the conference rooms are named after viral videos, like forget about Coke and Mentos, like they were talking about guitar, lowercase g. Um, I didn't, I thought that was a music video. Like I read it as a music video when I first saw it. And when I finally um, tracked him down through Naver, this Korean social networking site, I, um, he, I actually saw him in person. He's a missionary and he came to New York and played that piece in um, Astor Place with his cap pulled in hopes of being recognized. And a couple people were like, that's that kid. Um, he, and he played with the Red Hot Chili Peppers. He had kind of a career. Um, so he explained to me that it was a how-to video, and it was a how-to video, and this is astounding. So downstairs in his living room, he would practice um, violin and piano, which he was expected to do. But upstairs in his room, he wanted to do this kind of shred guitar that was in a Baroque, but that was this Pachelbel's canon piece. So it was like Baroque chamber music um, that he had been doing downstairs, but then upstairs with headphones into this webcam. So he became, there's a Japanese term, hikikamori, it's, um, Charisma Hiki, it's a, a famous shut-in. So a person that doesn't leave their room but becomes famous on the internet. And so he was sort of that. Um, he had all these followers and people that were interested in his version of this thing. And um, But he's extremely shy and like a lot of virtuoso guitarists who hide behind makeup or hair or a bucket, there's bucket head, um, he um, pulls his cap over his face almost entirely while he plays. So you can see his fingers. So when I talked to him I said, why did you do that? And he said, I wanted to show people my way of playing, and I also wanted feedback on it. Like the reason that chamber music existed in the first place, chambers, so that you don't just hear the music recorded, because the hope is you'll be able to do it too. So you want to come up close and see the instruments and, and see how people are doing, how they're playing the harpsichord, so you might be able to reproduce the finger work. And you can't, you can't do that at a distance if you're seeing it on, you know, on stage at the beacon or whatever. So. Um, in a weird way, he brought back, you know, something that complicated that he brought back this way of getting really close to it and looking at it and, with this video. But he also pulled his cap down because he only wanted people to, to hear the music and he also believes he's very ugly and didn't, just didn't want to be seen. So there wasn't, I was so used to reading it through an American lens, I was sure this was like a bid for fame. Like he was a kid that made a video in hopes of getting a record deal and while we're in New York, a, a couple of record labels wanted to meet with him and he just didn't want to meet with them because for him the whole thing is feedback like what do you think I did wrong what do you think like he would skim the comments and they were like this guy's better than Hendrix this is the greatest thing I've ever seen I think it's a hoax the sounds not synced did you yeah you know you know how the first ones are usually like holy shit and the yeah. later they're like you fit this is a fake it's always like that like you could just be like you um, so he would read he ignored those and then just paid attention to his, he has a weird way of moving his pinky or like the vibrato's wrong or whatever and just try to improve his performance. But then also he wanted to show people what he had done and see if they would do it back because he was also, you know, it's going a little far on this one thing, but it's, since it was such an early entry and it wasn't, it wasn't labeled as a how-to video, I feel like I just used um, YouTube to find out how to fold this tent, like really hard pop-up tent. And, uh, 
you know, none of them are pros. It's not short. It's not clear when they do it. So I had to like watch a ton of them. But so they're doing something, as you say, other than just like showing their expertise, you know? And I think that's what he was doing too, like being vulnerable about his mistakes, but also wanting to show, look how the direction I took this in for this kind of back and forth. The last thing I'll say is in the US, this bothered him a lot. It was kind of like the heyday of Green Day, or at least he thought that everyone here was listening to Green Day and in Europe. Um, and he was like, we're so good at guitar. Why do you all listen so much to people who are so bad at the guitar? And um, to find people that wanted to be really, really good at this particular kind of music, he needed to um, communicate with Midwestern Americans and Northern people from Northern England. Because they were like apparently the only people interested in playing this like you know, really complicated guitar music. And they didn't have like a tablature language in common. So that when they first saw online video, and that's why they were such early adapters, they were like, oh, finally, this is a way to talk about music without, you know, taps. And um, so all that went into it. So, you know, when I saw these tent people, some of them are trying to create a brand a little bit, you know, and they're like, I'm, um, one of them is like called sexy camper or like urban camper or something where she's just like, I hate getting dirty, but I go camping. And like, you have to wade through her persona to be like, how do I get this tent down? <laughs> you know? Um, and then there's another person that like fun too, doesn't like his head in the picture, you know, but he's pretty good. But uh, you know, then some people trying to do selfies, it's like really hard to see it, but I pieced them together, you know, and also people have such mixed motives for being on YouTube, you know? It like, I think some of that is that t tension that I love in that video. I mean, I, I'm assigning you to watch the video because it's so good. But it's the level of shyness from here up. It's like charisma hiki. It's like shyness, shut in, don't see me, I'm ugly. And then this incredible virtuosity down here. You know, anyone before YouTube or before online video who's gonna pick up a guitar and play for a room of people has to have like chutzpah and arrogance. Um, and. Um, you know, I think the first discovery that like he just could be really damn good at this piece and play for people, you know, was sort of a revelation. And I think, you know, Sexy Camper has done that too a little bit. She's like, I wear makeup while I go camping and I want some points for that, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, I watch a lot of unhaul videos, you know, videos of people who've just oh, been yeah. shopping and then they just, you guys know haul videos? Oh yeah, then they just take out clothes. <laughs> they just like, I got this top. I got these socks. They're going to be great. I got this. Uh, <laughs> they just go on forever. But I mean, the thing is, why are we even speculating? There's Twitch. Like, people just like to watch weird things, you know? And, and I mean, I had hung around the networks and they were guessing. What do people want? Like, you know, friend, is the friends model stale? If we make two of the friends obese, will that be interesting? And then online, they're like, how about guitar videos and haul? And, you know, racking up the views. Um, so, uh, I don't know. I hope that sort of addresses your question. By the way, I'm going to sneak in one before this gentleman. A lot of people, including some Googlers, are really embarrassed about YouTube commenters. I oh, think you yeah. have a different point of view, don't you? I, I do. I mean, YouTube commenters are like where the rubber hits the road for the id of the internet. And that you either love them or you hate them. Um, I love them. I mean, I just polyglot. I mean, just with enormous allowances for the fact that so many people are in their second and third language or and are not practiced in, you know, reasoned dialogue and exchange of views. Um, I do a little bit in here with um, comments on a Beyonce video, and they're incredibly powerful. I mean, if you like the arc of a YouTube comment section, the like, holy shit, this is fraud thing, or just like, this is a Betty Page video, you need to look at this, you know, people just deep dives into it. I don't understand. Everyone hates YouTube comment sections, and yet, people write YouTube comments all the time. So I'm not buying this because yeah, because there there are so many YouTube comments. Oh my gosh, if Google decides to shut down comments like they keep doing, I mean, this is not like a nanny state world here. We like can be subjected to, I mean, what? There's like white nationalism and there's people swearing, but there's a, a lot more than that too. There were muggers in New York City in the 70s and it was still a great time to be there. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Uh, thanks for coming to uh, give the talk. Uh, so I think for a lot of us who, I would say before Google was our first experience of the internet, yeah. um, and you were talking about Excalibur and yeah. having this kind of 
um, you know, it was it was it was kind of like a private club almost, yeah. right? And you get in, and you're like, oh, I'm the only person who has internet access in on like my block, and yeah. or like I'm talking to uh, people, number of people I'm talking to, I can count on two hands, yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. And um, now, in 2016, you know, people coming on the internet for the first time that uh, it's a much more public. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and it's much more about kind of a, you know, people use the phrase sharing culture, that yeah. sort of thing. Do you, uh, how much do you think that's changed sort of the, um, definitely like the performativeness of, yeah. of being on the internet, but just, you know, uh, art and culture on the internet in general? Yeah. Um, I think that they, you know, the culture works in this, in this, um, very loose or sort of to put this very, schematically a dialectical way so um there's been there's pushback on that so facebook has us register name rank and serial number i'm not athena anymore if my face is connected to my children it's connected i'm beholden to and responsible to whole a whole bunch of images and words that you know keep me in bounds i mean facebook is like for me a one at 46 a wonderful retirement community that is blessedly free of any of you lively young people that um that and we get to talk about like we're democrats and republicans and we have reasonable conversations you know um and um and then Twitter, where I also spend a lot of time, is obviously a different idiom. You can, you know, there's more bots. You can make up names. And that has more of the, like, rough and ready world of um, that I remember or that I like in YouTube comments. Um, but the carving out of those small spaces so that you can have that experience again is, um, is what I see as the pushback against the, like, Facebook monolith. Um, so um, secret Facebook groups have been amazing. I just saw one that's um, a, this gay one for Hillary that's called Hillary is Madonna, where they just spend a lot of time talking about how hot she is and how great all her outfits are. Um, and um, and um, I'm on a bunch for Hillary and uh, and a bunch for you know people in my demographic. Some of them my neighbors, and they're you know it's just like 15 of us, and we're just pile. It might as well be Excalibur. I mean we're just on there all the time. It's in depth. We know each other. Um, it's invite only. And uh, you know, I was just talking to this like um, uh, aspiring rapper, and I was like, I mean, you have probably have something, you know, for music. And he was like, actually, I have one for couponers. He belongs to this board for couponers, which has fifty thousand members, and they share information on couponing. And he gets so many deals that I was like, I need to look into couponing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so you know, that like um, you know uh, the. I get a lot of this understanding of the internet and in this book from urban theory. So the you know the tension between like a Robert Moses highway builder builds you know big tower blocks, and then like a like Jane Jacobs who admired like the 50s way that you cobble together a little neighborhood with like tenements and little you know bodegas and places to sell things and ways that things kind of work themselves out. And there's still so many hybrid spaces like that you know on the internet. Um, I met this woman in Montana not long ago who said she doesn't use the internet, she doesn't like social networking, Facebook, it's too public. Um, but she's had one use for it, which is that she's been a member of a total web 1.0 um, message board for people who suffer, suffer from fibromyalgia. And it's been like, she's been using it for 18 years or something, and she said, I'm finally meeting my best friend. She's coming from New York. My best friend and I have never met her. I've been talking to her for 18 years about you know our sickness, and she's coming to meet me. And I said, you know, I thought, it sounds like you use the internet in a really good way. You know, that's like a power player, you know? Um, and I've been surprised at how many, like, how many nooks and crannies are thriving. Um, you know, in a kind of pushback. Um, it's hard to codify it. It's hard to make money on it. You know, it's like the hall videos. You just, those are the times where like the culture delights you because you just have no idea, you know, where it's going. Prison talk is a huge board for incarcerated people and the people who love them. You don't need to report on the like, you know, nationwide penal colony. Just hang out on that board. It's amazing how like the texture of prison life. I mean, just, just the fragment of the board devoted to poetry by prisoners in various prisons is itself extraordinary and you know something no one would have predicted you know it's an old it's a i think 15 year old board started by a 
Felon, um, who's out now, and he like advocates for internet access in prisons um, and prison reform. And that was, you know, it was amazing to get that glimpse of that. Um, so I think it's, I just think the, the culture maintains itself in a really in a beautiful way. So, you know, once we have one fear, like I just was hearing that, you know, it's possible that people don't want connected homes, you know? And I, I just gave a talk on Bloomberg TV about connected cars and millennials say that they know cars are all going to be connected and they expect them to be connected. But just because we expect it as this like horrible matrix, you know, inevitability doesn't mean it'll happen. Like the culture will surprise us again and people will push back on it and they'll create maker culture and foodism, you know, undigitizable experiences that have risen in tandem with the web. Um, you know, people going to dark internet or taking tech Sabbaths or whatever, but, um, but even more strenuously, or reviving vinyl or live music, or even like seeing each other live. I mean, one of the um, first promises at IBM was like, oh, this is so great. We never have to go into an office again. We'll be teleconferencing all the time. I mean, that's the last thing anyone wants to do now. You want to like look at someone's crazy capillaries. And did you hear about this guy at Face? I mean, he's not at Facebook. He, um, it sort of sounds urban mythy, but he had an addiction to Facebook. That's what he thought. And he really wanted to jump off his phone, so he started doing an LSD breakfast. Is this like well known? <laughs> okay. Oh yeah, you know. So like a little bit, a tiny microdose of some hallucinogen in the morning, and he discovered that his phone, he lost interest in his phone because the faces of people on the bus became so compelling. And you know, faces are really a lot more interesting than our screens. Like it's, you know, we look at that same little few square inches, and then just look at a person like. Steve Jobs says that, or said that his he wanted screens to be oleophobic, like no, no oil could stick to them, and like Johnny Ive hates humans. You know, he just thinks we're disgusting, basically, <laughs> and like doesn't want us to like get our sticky, gross human selves <laughs> on screens. Um, but um, but our sticky, gross human selves are really beautiful and fascinating. You know. You don't need the LSD. You were reading this out of your book, and so now I can actually quote it back. But um, oh, yeah. uh, you say uh, digital forms are best illuminated by cultural criticism, and it shows the Internet's glorious illusion that the Internet is life because, yeah. of course, the Internet is not life. Um, it's an artificial regime. And I'm wondering, like, do you really mean that? I mean, it sounds like even from the rest of your questions, you're like, art is a part of life and you know everything that's happening online is real just as much as everything that's happening face to face yeah. just different right and so i'm, I'm wondering yeah. if you could say a little bit more about what your thoughts are on, on this is real or this is fake it's made up it's online it's not real life um this may sound like a cop out i love that question this may sound like a cop out and um, marshall McLuhan said at one point that electronic circuitry is orientalizing the west um and collapsing binary distinctions and certainly like the one between like is this deception or is it true would be one of those that i feel like you know the internet has pushed on really hard um so i say illusion but the kind of illusion that i mean is the illusion of a game where we have these proxies like when I was playing Dungeons and Dragons, there used to be this fear, this dread fear among adults that we might start actually thinking we were like high priestesses and clerics and um, like snap and go into the Dungeons and Dragons world. And there was even a novel about it. And, you know, it was right around the corner. And but, you know, I didn't think I was a high priestess any more than like when you're playing Monopoly, you think you are a shoe. You know, like, I really wanted to win a Monopoly. I really put a lot of investment in bro getting Broadway and getting Park Place and getting building houses on them. And, you know, I'm the shoe. I've got this much money. But I knew that I didn't have that much money and wasn't, you know, I, I didn't, it wasn't hard for me to draw that distinction. The same way that when you willingly suspend disbelief to read a novel, you both know that the things are happening and they're not happening. It's no fun if you don't invest in them. It's no fun if you don't care about the characters. Um, but it, um, but it, but you know, to overinvest in the illusion. And by the way, there have always been fears that people would turn Don Quixote and f believe the things in novels too, you know, and start to be like like the readers of Dickens who were like, "Little Joe died. Ah, we need to like petition to bring him back to life," um, or in Misery, um, where you like believe the characters are real. Um, but that's not all of us, you know. Most of us can live in that 
like understanding that this is an illusion, it's not real life, and it's pleasurable to commit ourselves to it, sometimes painful. Um, but you know, sometimes I think my Twitter handle like takes sniper fire for me, like keeps my soul safer. You know, it's better because all those like this picture of me, this one made like on a computer, <laughs> you know, like with very few elements taken from my flesh and blood person. She does a lot of work for me out in the world. <laughs> it's just like, you go deal with these people. I'm going to sit home. Um, anyway, thank you so much. This was really fun. Thank you.